Today we're talking about, oh man, abortions? If only I could stick to uncontroversial topics like whether to invade Iran. That's right, I just broke 500 subscribers and apparently thought, well, now's a perfect time to lose a few. Whether I'm rowing or waiting, I am heading right for the deep end of this very controversial topic. But I have a specific mission. We're going to get to the heart of this issue and try to figure out what the Constitution defines as a person. Now, the Supreme Court's been trying to answer this question for 50 years, but I have a 15 minute political comedy show. So look out, constitutional scholars. Now, I'm assuming that everybody watching this video already knows the opinion they're going to walk away from this with. So don't worry, I'm not going to try to convince anybody of anything. Man, I really thought abortions were murder, but this guy got in some really good zingers, so I might change my worldview. Instead, I want to look at the legal precedent set by three game-changing abortion cases, so that when you're debating someone in the comment section of Trump's latest Twitter post, you'll be able to cite the facts. So let's get started with the grandfather of all abortion cases, Roe v. Wade, a case that's surprisingly more nuanced than most people give it credit for. So what did Roe v. Wade say? Well, let's jump right in. We'll hear arguments in number 18, uh, Roe against uh, Wade. Before we get deep into it, I want to start by saying that the Supreme Court is like a book club for the Constitution. What do you think the founders meant when they wrote this? If I were to ask a founder this question, what do you think they'd say based on this writing? Their goal is not to engage in answering these questions using their own moral opinions. As I always say, citing morality in a Supreme Court case is like citing the Bible in a paper on evolution. So what did the founders think about abortion? Well, unsurprisingly, between talking about the separation of powers of the executive and legislative branch, there wasn't a ton of time left over to get into the moral issues that would come to a head 200 years out. So some creative license was definitely taken. The main constitutional writing that their court based their opinion on was the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, the amendment that was written to free the slaves. I think the 14th Amendment is equally an appropriate place. Under the rights of persons to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, I think in as far as liberty is meaningful, that liberty to these women would mean liberty from being forced to continue the unwanted pregnancy. So let me get this straight. In your pro-abortion argument, you're citing the part of the Constitution that says no state should deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law? Well, that sounds like a terrible idea. It wasn't though because of the question we set out to find at the top of the episode. When does a fetus become a person who gets these protections? If you read this decision, it's no secret that they struggled to find this answer. They write, the Constitution does not define person in so many words. Yeah, we scanned the original document and there was one mention of person, when it said that black people were three-fifths of a person, but I think we should kind of not mention that one ever again. This was going to be the problem when weighing the two groups between mothers, who we know are humans, and fetuses who, well, the jury's out whether they get constitutional protections. So what did they end up going with as far as a human definition? Those persons born are citizens. Uh, the enumeration clause, we count those people who are born. The Constitution, as I see it, gives protections to people after birth. Going back to the 14th Amendment that freed the slaves, the Roe v. Wade decision said Section 1 of the 14th Amendment contains three references to person. The first, in defining citizen, speaks of persons born or naturalized in the United States. So in a roundabout way, either because Abraham Lincoln was either super woke or not thinking about the unborn when freeing the slaves, fetuses don't have constitutional protections in the same way pregnant women have due process rights to their own bodies. There are of course exceptions because based on what I've just said, well, any abortion ban would be illegal. In the Roe v. Wade decision, the Supreme Court used the trimester system to break it up. For the first trimester, the abortion decision must be left to the medical judgment of the pregnant woman's attending physician. This means states have no rights to dictate the first trimester policies. 
Then for the second trimester, the state, in promoting the interest of the health of the mother, may regulate the abortion procedures in ways that are reasonably related to maternal health. Not sure why risky abortion procedures are fair game during the first trimester, but sure. So during the second trimester, states can ban certain abortion procedures in the interest of health for the won't be mother. Finally, the last trimester. The state, in promoting the interest in the potentiality of human life, may, if it chooses, regulate and even proscribe, which is a fancy term for forbid, abortion, except where necessary for the preservation of the life or health of the mother. This is where you have states legally banning late-term abortions. So yeah, Roe v. Wade is a little bit more complicated than people think. But now it's time for the fun part. States trying to poke holes in this ruling to weaken it. Specifically, we start with the 1989 case of Webster v. Reproductive Health Services. We'll hear argument now in number 88605, William L. Webster v. Reproductive Health Services. Who would have guessed that a case involving a guy named Webster would come down to definitions? Now you'll remember the case name. This decision focused on a lot more things than we're going to talk about today. Trust me, this video was originally 30 minutes long. What we're going to focus on is a major change made to Roe v. Wade's trimester system. The question here was about viability testing, a test that doctors would run to see if the fetus could survive outside of the mother. This statute was arguing that conducting abortion law using arbitrary time measures like trimesters was not the way we should be determining who's a human. And the court agreed, writing in their decision, Rose's rigid trimester analysis has proved to be unsound in principle and unworkable in practice. Well, tell me what you really think. Instead, they argued that We have said at the outset, under Roe, that Missouri and every other state has an important and legitimate interest in the fetus throughout pregnancy. And even adopting the Roe standard, uh, certainly that interest becomes compelling at viability. This court has said so. So the new standard that left this case was first trimester, up to the physician. Second trimester, up until the fetus is viable, you can't ban abortions, but the state can regulate them for maternal health. And viable babies, also known as now the third trimester, well, you can ban abortions and regulate them as harshly as you want. And this brings us to our final case to tinker with the Roe framework, the 1992 case of Planned Parenthood of Southern Pennsylvania v. Casey. We'll hear argument now in number 91744, Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania Bertha versus Robert P. Casey. 91902, Robert P. Casey versus Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania. This case was really the one that just walked away from Roe v. Wade's regulations and established its own weaker rules to judge whether unfair regulations were being put on abortions, called the, well, the undue burdens test. Really put some effort into that one, you guys. The majority of the description of this new test was, well, don't worry, this is exactly like Roe v. Wade in regards to regulation. But it made one major change. To quote the decision, Roe's rigid trimester framework is rejected. This was a long time coming as the second and third trimester were now defined by viability as opposed to, well, trimesters. What this did was it combined the first and second trimester to form one big non-viable semester. This new logic was incorporated into the aforementioned undue burden standard. An undue burden exists, and therefore a provision of law is invalid, if its purpose or effect is to place substantial obstacles in the path of a woman seeking an abortion before the fetus attains viability. Okay, we're just immediately committing to that viability standard then rather than the trimester system. That was fast. The main takeaway here is now the state can get involved in the regulation of first trimester abortions, as long as it's in the interest of women's health. So this brings us to today and the final healthcare fight you've probably heard something about. Protesters quick to react in Missouri after becoming the latest state to pass one of the nation's most restrictive abortion bills. If enacted, the new law makes abortions illegal after eight weeks. Exceptions apply for medical emergencies only, not for pregnancies caused by rape or incest. 
This new round of abortion laws doesn't directly seek to overturn Roe v. Wade, but rather redefine the redefined standard for personhood, from the fetus's viability to the fetus having a heartbeat. Because I'm not sure if you've noticed yet, but nobody at the highest levels of law seems to have any idea when a person becomes a person. Whether you agree with it or not, I think you could make some sort of argument that heartbeats could be representative of life. I mean, you're considered clinically dead when your heart stops. Of course, at the post-conception point when the baby has a heartbeat, well, very few people know they're even pregnant. So it stands to reason that this redefining of life would essentially end the protections of Roe v. Wade, because you could ban abortion at about 8 weeks. So that's what might soon be going to trial. And frankly, if our founders had just been a little more specific, we wouldn't be in this mess right now. So if you ever have the opportunity to create a country, remember to specify what a human is. Heck, you can even make it a footnote in your constitution. Until next time though, thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news looking into the legal arguments of the day, remember to subscribe by clicking on this floating logo to the left of my head. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring and give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.